Hello and welcome to an episode with my Amazon guy. Today I'm joined by Vanessa Hung and she is such a lovely lady. She won the Prosper Hackathon, by the way. And, and so uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, template files and flat files. This is a topic that every advanced seller has to become familiar with. So Vanessa, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for the invite, Stephen. It's a pleasure. Yes. Uh, and you are quite the pleasurable person to speak to. Every time I talk to you, I feel like I get some value and some knowledge. So this is the first time uh, Vanessa has been coming on to our podcast today. Um, but you may have seen Vanessa out there. Uh, Vanessa, go ahead and introduce yourself and talk to us about uh, some of the things that you're up to before we go into the topic today. Perfect. So I am the CEO and founder of Online Seller Solutions. And we are an agency that solves problems for Amazon sellers. So different from probably my Amazon guy or other agencies in the space that do kind of everything in the umbrella of, of uh, Amazon, uh, an Amazon business, we only specialize in solving the issues that you can have in the catalog, inventory, or account health. It's kind of giving the experience that sellers need to have when they try to contact Amazon to solve their problems, right? Um, yeah. So, so your phone is ringing off the hook right now because everybody has an Amazon problem right now. All, all the time. All the time. Yeah. Um, yes. It's so funny that when they make a change, like, for example, what happened with the UPC GS1 changes, that the was a fire. Email. Like, yeah, the email was a fire. So, it, yeah, we do that. That's exactly what we specialize on. And it's like projects. It's super easy in and out. So with that, uh, we help sellers. Also, one of my biggest uh, roles that I think I have in the industry is... Uh, education. So I, I invest a lot of time in, you know, creating content to teach people about the unsexy stuff, what I call unsexy, is the account management part, right? Everybody knows or everybody that sells on Amazon needs to do it. But normally, it's overlooked or undervalued. And we don't really pay attention because that's not the sexy part of like SEO or PPC, you know, so I, I do that, and that's probably my favorite part of my whole uh, job. And also, I'm a community ambassador for Carbon6. Carbon6 is a suite of tools for Amazon sellers, and we provide solutions that go from PPC management, like automation, to uh, inventory management. So it is everything under the umbrella and possible solutions that sellers need. Uh, I'm, I'm doing their building the community. So that part of creating content, being in co contact with other sellers, other service providers, kind of understanding what, what the community needs so we can put out the content and tools that people are looking for, right? Great. And by the way, we're an affiliate of Carbon6. I posted a link there if you want to check out some of their tools. Uh, pretty much every other week, they buy a new software and add it to the tool suite. So you guys want to check that out. All right, so we're going to dive into our topic now. So, Vanessa, um, feel free to share your screen. Feel free to present and, and talk us through some of the things that people need to know about flat files and templates and all that good stuff. And then for those that are watching in the audience, maybe you have a question. And I know like 17 people are going to ask how to change UPC code. So feel free to talk about that today um, yeah. and all the challenges that is or brand name changes or, man, I can't get my parentage to work. Um, or in my experience, just this past week, in fact, uh, Amazon, so, so Game of Thrones had the House of Dragons season finale on Sunday. And I sell a Tumblr, which I'll pull up on screen here in a moment. Um, and it had a, a Game of, uh, you know, House of Dragons um, Tumblr on it. And Amazon, bless their hearts, had changed this product's image right here to be the 30-ounce version. So this happened on Friday morning. And I, I had gone back and forth. I spent 10 hours with Amazon trying to troubleshoot this to switch this image back to the correct one. My seller contribution was fine. I obviously own the trademark, the brand registry, and I filed ticket after ticket and Amazon wouldn't fix it. And I, they kept lying to me and telling me it was the parentage that was the problem. So I deleted the parentage and this, the problem still persisted. I filed ticket after ticket. And finally, after I sent an email to the Jeff at Amazon email, the problem got resolved. So, so even me, um, as a as a supposed Amazon expert, deals with these problems on my own brand 
and and loading flat files is very helpful to solve some of this stuff. All right, so we got people commenting in here. We got Janessa saying, watching from the Philippines today. We love our hey. friends down in the Philippines. Uh, and Vanessa, feel free to hit that share screen and show us some of the things you got whenever you're ready. Perfect. Jeff says, uh, so will a flat file upload fix a stuck title, bullets, or images? And and I'll give I'll give the short answer sometimes. But Vanessa, yeah. give us the long answer. <laughs> it depends. So let's go back to your to your example on the images. So one thing that we need to understand is that images, Stephen, are um, a conditional or like a subjective feel. Why? Because the it's like a separate contribution. It's even like a separate department with within the catalog you know, department on Amazon. And if that ha if that changes for some reason, and this could be somebody uh, uploading the wrong image in a different marketplace, that's also that you need to pay attention. So if you have the Canada and Mexico open and somebody there just changed the picture, they can, you know, bring that contribution to the US and, and show it in all the marketplaces. But the thing is that with images, they are subjective to the person that is helping you. So let's say that you call or you email them and you say like, hey, my image is wrong and we need to change this to XX. And they're like, okay, um, let, let us let us see or let, let's troubleshoot or send us images of the manufacturer website, which is the thing that if you want to make image changes, make sure to, to always send a link for the manufacturer website, even if it's your own, you know, Shopify or D2C or whatever you have, where the main image of that page is the main image that you want to have uh, on Amazon. Because if not, it will be a discretion or at the discretion of the sales rep that helps you. Like even when you bring all the documentation, they have the ability to say yes and no to an image. So it is crazy. It is so subjective. And that's one, probably one of the areas in, within a listing that gets the most amount of trouble. Because also that's the other thing. When we try to optimize images, so let's say that you have that listing and it's beautiful, but you know, with the research you do and with the things that, that are happening you, you you tell your team like, hey guys, because the second season is coming, we need to change this and that, whatever, right? You want to optimize the images. Once you do that and you try to upload it again and they don't, they, it doesn't work with a flat file, you need to open the case and you need to tell them why this is important and why you want to change it because they're sticky. The images are sticky and, are, and they are discretional to the person that is helping you. Um, so that's good that you were able to fix it with the Jeff team. Always, so always, the, always. Yeah, this is the Canadian listing. So you can see how these are two are parented right here. And we have mm -hmm. two, not I wouldn't call them hijackers. I just call them like unauthorized sellers. And what they're typically doing is they're, they're buying from the U.S. and then just reselling it in Canada. Mm -hmm. And one of them might have effed up the data um, and loaded the 30 ounce to the 12 ounce listing which is yeah. why it could have caused me problems in the U.S. So I have seen yeah. that. It's an incredibly yeah. insightful uh, commentary there, Vanessa. Yeah. You know, it's also, it's it's funny. The reason why probably they needed to upload an image, the main image specifically, is because if they don't do that after they created the listing, the listing were, was suppressed. So yeah. they just did a wrong job. It's like, oh, yeah, whatever. Let me put whatever image, you know, just to get the, the listing unsuppressed. So yeah, those contributions happen a lot. You just need to best best tip there is always send the manufacturer website where the main image or any image you want to have on Amazon is there. And you tell them like, hey guys, I want to have my second image is the second image of the website or stuff like that. That is not that that is an argument that they won't be able to, you know, overlook and say, like, oh not really. No, it's like this is a manufacturer website, period. Right. So good. Good. That, that, that's a very common case. And to answer Jeff uh, question, and as you said, it depends. So one of the things that I that I really want to deconstruct in this, like in the industry and the and around flat files, and probably I also am part of the reason why this is so misused is people think that with flat files, you can solve everything. 
right? Anything that you have in the catalog, you can solve it with flat files. This is probably not true. That, that, that is like 70% not true, okay? Uh, you can contribute to attributes and you can refresh in a harder way than using the Seller Central UI uh, to upload the information. But if something is stuck, the only way that you could be able to fix it through a flat file is if you delete it with the inventory loader file using the X delete feature and then upload it again as a full upload in your regular flat file. If which that does scary. which huh? is there any seller listening to this right now that is okay and comfortable with deleting their own product? Not yes. something that every seller wants to do or is inclined to do. And quite frankly, I have to say, I want to call Amazon out on this. Like Amazon, seriously, I have to delete my product information and lose sales for 24 hours or whatever while your data catalog is messed up. That is not good user experience for sellers. And, and sellers, I, you know, I, I can't blame you for being upset with Amazon's catalog system. It's kind of a wreck. But anyway, so... So yeah, so 70% of things can't be solved by a catalog upload. I, I, I probably agree with that stat. But one of the things that I found that works for me is loading the UPC when it's blanked out. And that's a great thing to do in a template file upload. That's probably one of my favorite hacks. Do you ever do that? Does that what fix do you anything mean for it? when it's blanked out? So, so like sometimes in the, in the data load, one of two things will happen. Either uh, a seller will make a duplicate SKU on the same ASIN and, they, and then they delete the original SKU at some point. Mm -hmm. And then on the duplicate, the UPC is not in the UPC field. And instead it shows ASIN. Right, ASIN. Yeah. And, and so I get hired all the time with like, hey, I can't update my data. Uh, my image is stuck. And the first yeah. thing that I look for is, is the UPC filled in? Because if it's not, simply filling that in could, could make the data reflect. Yeah. And you know what? Also, Stephen, this is going to the root cause. Like your, your will to, to the way that you just mentioned to solve it is perfectly fine. But the root cause of that issue is that main contributions when when you create an ASIN or a listing in the catalog, the main contribution will always come with, from the original SKU. And that is super important and super relevant. I find out like that, like this year, and I started creating content around that. Original SKUs are like your holy SKU. Like I actually, so as a best practice that I recommend is when you create an ASIN and you, you create the original SKU, the, the first one, the, be, the very beginning where you put the UPC and all that, that SKU should be the SKU where you change contributions and you create you can create parallel SKUs to send, for example, to FBA and to have an FBM offer. So so but that original SKU is the one that has all the contributions and you're gonna make changes there and not in the mirror SKUs that are the second or third or fourth. Original SKUs are extremely important and, and we need to save that data. Super, super relevant. Lots of people are piling in questions, so we're going to just dive into these. Nikita asks, I followed your flat file tutorial to try and get my brand page linked to my product. I don't know if she's talking about you or me. I have a tutorial on this, though. Um, but Nikita, that's great. Fantastic to hear that. Hopefully, it got resolved for you. Um, Hura says, yes, I use the purge file with an X. Make sure we have a category report backup. Agree. It's not useful. Yeah. Uh, KCT says, Steve, if I do private label in the U.S. and wholesale in Germany with two separate accounts, if the wholesale account gets suspended, will the U.S. private label account also get suspended? Most likely not, Casey, but there is a risk um, and especially a higher risk if it's suspended for multiple account scenarios. Uh, let's see what else we got in queue here. We got a couple more. Let's go over to Jeffrey Vallon. Recently started getting error messages of incorrect date format when uploading shipping templates. No problems with this in the past. I've tried many workarounds without success. Any advice? I don't think I've seen this for three years. Incorrect date format is for the um, expire, expiration dates on the- It might be. Yeah. If it's for the expiration dates, I, seen, I saw that um, maybe like a month ago. And for some reason, something happened in their templates. And, you know, you have, we have seen that how the shipping experience changed like dramatically, like in the past six months. 
So I believe it was a glitch because they were not taking uh, the um, expiration dates in the US format. It wasn't a thing. It, so we we just wait, like we opened the case and it wasn't, the case wasn't even resolved. It just, it never got answered, but the issue was fixed. Uh, we didn't do anything. It was just a glitch in the system where they were not taking the expiration date format. If you guys are just joining us, we're doing a template file podcast today with Vanessa Hung, and she is a troubleshooting expert. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting up with her uh, over at uh, Helium 10 and Prosper events in the past. Um, so, so yeah, date format. I've seen that one time three years ago. I can't remember how I solved that one, but it's that's a pretty fringe one. Uh, so, so you're saying on that one, Vanessa, just file a ticket and hope for the best. Yeah, I, uh, the ticket we filed wasn't even resolved. Like they didn't say like, oh yeah, it was resolved. But when we tried to upload it again, it was fine. So I don't know. Jeff Allen says, was the OTF Hell Week water bottle you were drinking from, Vanessa? Yes, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> and I've got I've got one of my uh, this is the way beer glasses. So if you want to support uh, the Age of Sage. Uh, channel just go to amazon.com slash age of sage and you can pick one up for yourself for the star wars fans out there uh rudy's coming in and watching from houston texas hello there arfin says hello dear stephen pope my new account has deactivated how to write an appeal or plan of action on amazon please help me so wow. you want you want to you want to open that can of worms let's do it vanessa what what should arfin do well it, this will depend a lot on the type of suspension that you have. So we don't know if it's deactivated for uh, related accounts. For most, having, most likely it is. Most likely. Oh, yeah, well. That's, that's, well, that's generally what I see. Yeah. Okay. Like a bunch of investigation and trying to get the uh, answer from Amazon or you know, a cue from Amazon is what account and what things. And you need to prove like without knowing anything without knowing if this is or what account it is or why it is like you we need to be very transparent as sellers of like okay why this happened right could i be guilty of it because i sign up in my friend's house that also have seven other accounts or do i do business with somebody that you know have multiple accounts if that's the case you really need to make your point on like this is a completely separate business so that's that's a part of transparency and investigation that you need to have before writing a POA. But in essence, the POA has three uh, sections. So you need to find the root cause and be very honest and, and very detailed on what was the root cause and why you think that happened and all the details of like on Wednesday, I don't know, the 20th, I went to my friend's house and I log in into this. I, IP and that's why it got connected to X account. So very, very, very detailed. That's the root cause and you need to explain what happened. Then it's what other things you need to solve it, which in this case of account deactivation, you don't have much things to do, right? It's just like we have, a, you need to explain why that's a completely different business. And the last one is what are the things that you're going to do in the future to solve that? or to not to prevent that from happening. And obviously that part of you need to comply with TOS and you need to do all the right stuff to not get connected to other accounts, having a different IPI and all the stuff. And most times working in reverse. So what I like to do is start with the things that you're gonna do in the future to prevent the situation and you're and working your way back to the root cause. That's normally the best way instead of doing it the other way, like from the root cause and way up, because sometimes we miss a lot of information. So if we start from the future, uh, that those POAs are way better. And for those that want to do lots of reinstatement and suspension work, just a quick plug for Mag School. This is the one course that we have as an expensive course. It's a thousand bucks, but you can enroll in that at mag-school.com. So for those that are dealing with these on a reoccurring situation we have all our best sops over there this is how we subsidize mag school and, and allow all of our other courses seo ppc design merchandising etc for 10 and 12, 20 bucks so usually the aggregators are the ones that buy it okay uh ch asks any tips for product hunting or course steven um so yeah we actually do have a course over at mag school 
um, for product research, uh, launching courses, even have one on international launching. But you want to check out probably the launching course would probably be a really good one for you, um, CH. Uh, and then we don't have one on product hunting quite yet, I don't think. Actually, we probably need a partner to help us write that particular one. Uh, there's a lot of experts out there with product sourcing. Vanessa, you have any suggestions right. on 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 lo locations to learn how to source and product hunt? Um, it depends. Product hunting for PL or product hunting for wholesale? Sounds well, like wholesale. I don't know. Uh, I would, yeah, I mean, it's a very different thing depending on what you're trying to do there. That That is a true yeah. point. Yeah. We also had uh, over the weekend, we released a video about product sourcing problems. I will post a link to that in the chat. Uh, and that was done by um, Global Product Sourcing. Uh, there was a company that shot 13 minutes of just here's all the top problems we see happening in product sourcing. So you may want to check that out as well nice. more of a product uh private label sort of angle Perfect. uh lung says i've launched a new product i run cerebro to check keywords the result is 414 total keywords 12 sponsored one organic and 403 amazon recommended how can i increase those numbers uh so so long uh you need sales that's the simple answer and if you don't have uh, sales coming in, you're not going to index for things. So you need to spend money on advertising. You need to you need to treat it like a honeymoon period, and try and get some of those sales going. So the Amazon recommended um, keywords are almost irrelevant for you at this point because you're not indexing on, on any of them. Um, we have a bunch of SEO hacks over at myamazonguy.com/seo, and you're going to want to check out those to figure out how to move some of these. But Vanessa. Um, do you have a favorite SEO hack? Anything you would recommend that people people do to index for keywords that you like? Uh, well, going to the, the the main topic that we were uh, talking about, which flat files. I believe that obviously you need to do your research, and and you are by far one of the experts on SEO I, that I don't understand the complexity because I that's not something that we do as much we do the problem solving but one of the things that you definitely can do with flat files and that's something that it's super overlooked by sellers is the fact that inputting keywords in the back end more than just obviously we have keywords like the search term or the subject matter in subcategories i think that disappear in almost all um but having those keywords in the back end, in the section of discovery. So let me share my screen and show you. Yep, please go ahead. Hit the present button and then I'll enable it. Okay. Here we go. All right. So we're okay. looking at a flat file. And, yeah. and today we're, we're trying to focus on troubleshooting problems with an emphasis on flat files today. But go ahead. Perfect. So if you guys are not familiar with it, this is the category listing report. Okay, and what basically this have is all the attributes related to your category and your product line for your listings, the subcategory. What the things for my answer that I'll say for uh, the question is if I want to rank, if I want to index, and that's something that you mentioned and you said it good, the recommended keywords that they are not, those are irrelevant right now because they're not indexing, okay? So one of the ways to index as well as putting those keywords in the subject matter field or, or in the keyword field, uh, they change names all the time, which is a very, very small um a, a small amount of characters that you have. You have a very small retail space for it. But the beauty of flat files is that they also give you a bunch of attributes as, and space to put those keywords, right? So you find this in the category listing report in the discovery section, and that's the green section right here, like the one that I have. The best way to to do those um, or to put those keywords in a way that will help you index and not necessarily will show in the pro in the detail page is using these these fields. So they will be the, for this particular brand. I have uh, this is a coffee brand, right? Probably these two are not relevant at all. Like is memorabilia or is autograph? That's not relevant. But the intent they use 
this is something that I, if I have my list of all the keywords that I know my product is relevant for, and some of them apply to be, or, or, a, or is a good answer for intended use, I will use that. For example, if this is a, this is a coffee, uh, for intended use, I'll put coffee maker, right? Because I sell pots that will go with a coffee maker or something like that. So in that way, you will tell Amazon that this is your type of product. And something that happens a lot, Stephen, that I believe change um, probably, I think a, a year ago or so, is that the way the algorithm is picking up listings and the way they are ranking stuff is way more broad than just the information that is in the search terms or in the keywords term or in the subject matter. They are trying to look listings in a more holistic way of give me all the attributes you have and I will put this on or, or I will rank you or index you in the right place. That's why they have a bunch of filters right now and filters are aligned to the attributes that you put here. So, for example, it could be searchable. And let me let me open the an Amazon page. So let's say that we are looking for coffee pots. OK, so if you see here, I have specialty food type. These are the the filters, right? Specialty food type, coffee format coffee flavor, caffeine type, coffee region, like look all the things that you can have, the information that you can have on your listing if you put it in the back end. And for example, let's say that I sell a coffee pot and this is organic, right? You will think that, oh, having organic in the search term or in the subject matter, it is extremely relevant. I, I And I agree when you start creating the listing and it's fresh from scratch. But this particular um, attribute could be in another uh, field. It could it could be in one uh, attribute here, one column here saying like uh, specialty, right? It could be specialty food type. So you will find it here and you will put here organic. The way you, in that way, you take out those keywords that you cannot have in your search term because you have on up to 250, right? 250 bytes. That's it. Like everything else, you need to input it in this section of a flat file, in the green section. So some Quite, things will be I irrelevant. Keywords call on there that nobody ever knows. Oh, that all. Yeah, that's a good that's a good call. A lot, of, lot, stuff, of, lot of columns don't do a whole lot. So some of these have way more impact than others. Yes. And the good thing is that for most, so my best practice there is try to fill in as much as possible, even the things that you think that are irrelevant, right? With keywords, because uh, there are three things that could happen. The first thing is that nothing happens, right? If I put here is memorabilia and put, and I input something like coffee pot, which is my, my main keyword. If I put this here, and the information is not relevant and that won't show up in the listing. That's just, I just didn't lose anything, right? I just put it there, nothing happens at all. You're, I'm not indexing, I'm not ranking at all. Then the other option is some stuff that you won't see in the pro detail page, but when I put it here, I'm, I'm still indexing. So if I put coffee pot here and that doesn't show in the pro detail page, but I, for but I still index for the keyword that I input there. That's amazing. That's fantastic. And those are my favorite fields. And one of one of the big things of this uh, flat file practice is that you will never know for sure what this will uh, or how this will impact your uh, SEO unless you try. It's like kind of a test. Besides the main. Uh, you know, other attributes or search terms or stuff like that. Those are a very impactful uh, fields. But the other ones that we don't know, like, for example, I don't know, record track count. Like, I don't know if that will impact my listing or not, but I, I want to take the risk of, of putting a keyword that is relevant and see what happens. So it's a bunch of trial and error, a bunch of testing. And the great thing is that you can also add 
different keywords. So for example, if I go to my, if I go to somebody or my competition and they have specialty food type, but I don't find that specific column on the, on, on my flat file, I can add that. And the way to add columns and the way to find for those attributes is through the browsing three no guide. So I don't know if we can pull it here. Let, just let me stop the screen and see if I can pull the policy here. But that's a policy that Amazon has for that's a, like the guide, the policy that Amazon has showing you all the attributes for all the categories. So that's where you find the new updates on, on, on new changes on the subcategories or categories, new SEO. And so Amazon you find that always announces these updates and informs all of us every day and sends us notices. So you, you yeah. never have to check this randomly to find out if there's a new attribute in your category. You never have to check to see if they've changed the parentage names and break them. Nope, never need to do any of that. So never do what Vanessa's saying and randomly download your CLR report and audit it. Uh, yeah, well, I don't think that's that's exactly what happens because <laughs> they just do stuff. It's so funny that the other, I don't know, recently they changed the elect, um, industrial category. You know, I don't know if you've seen that. The subcategory is now co named completely different and they merge some they stuff. They delete categories all the time. And yeah. then sometimes you get de-indexed and suppressed because you don't have a category. Then you yeah. have to troubleshoot it. All right, we got a few Super comments coming in I want to, want to read here. Zane off LinkedIn says, Stephen, you're doing great work. Appreciating. CH says, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, Shabez says, Q4 is very busy. Yes, Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, Z asks, what is the benchmark for highly competitive and less competitive keywords in case of competitor and keyword research? Um, so, so obviously, this is a moving target, not necessarily a template question. But I would say, Z, uh, that any keyword that has more than um, 500 search volume a month, you'll have some competition on it typically. Uh, anything north of 2,000, usually hyper competition. So that would be like highly competitive um, kind of as a benchmark response to you. Um, all right, so I'm looking through some other questions here. Z wants to know how to avoid hijackers. Which details should be removed on hazmat products? All right, so two very different questions here. Yeah. Um, I'll give you one that. hijacking tip and then I'll turn it over to you. Uh, make sure that your brand name is in your main image. Number one hijacker prevention tip I will give. And I live this myself directly on uh, this product right here. I had all kinds of people, cause this is a commodity product, right? All kinds of people were trying to list on my product here and they they did not ship it in Age of Sage product. Obviously they were violating my trademark and causing me sales loss. So I added the box to the main image and the hijackers dried up instantly. So that's what worked for me. But um, Vanessa, any any data tips, troubleshooting tips you can recommend on hijackers? Yes, of, of course. A more a more technical uh, way to prevent hijackers, mm -hmm. and this is this is probably the way of um, losing listings or losing catalog information as like super quick. Is if you're using a flat file, or if you're if you have a listing on Amazon. You should be optimizing every single field that is available for your category. Because if you don't do that, people can come and hijackers can come and input information that is wrong. So obviously, the hijacker that you mentioned is other sellers, in unauthorized sellers selling in your listings. But let's say that you have a you know an enemy, like a competitor that just want to shut you down. And what they will do they will download your or download a file for the category you're at. And they will say like your prod has CVD, right? It's a, it's, that's a restricted keyword. It's just an example. If they upload that in a field where you didn't have information before, your listing will go down immediately, immediately. This so is the number one black hat tactic that we've seen, uh, especially Chinese sellers loading it to Canada data to take down your products in the US, which is why Vanessa was talking earlier about making sure you load your data to multiple countries 
to prevent somebody from hijacking a listing. Um, so great tip there, Vanessa. Keep going. So that's the that, – let me just go back to the thing, uh, the flat file. So this – everything you see here, it is an opportunity. If it's empty, it is an opportunity for a hijacker to come in and put something that is wrong. And if you see that I have here some, some columns highlighted, these columns are – very sensitive to restrictions. So if you don't have this information, and it's very possible, I don't see this column in many uh, subcategories and categories, you basically need to add it manually. Like you go and add this information here in the second and third row, and then you're going to say that your product is not an adult product. But if you don't have this information at all, it's as easy as a, a competitor or, or a hijacker downloading your listing, put it in, in a flat file and saying that your product is an adult product and saying here, yes. With that, it's not that your listing will be detail page, detail page removed. You won't see the doc, but you won't be able to rank. You won't be able to do PPC. And you very certainly, like in, in most of the cases, you're going to fall off of your category. So those are three problems that you're going to encounter just by not having this information and, and having bad actors that want to take your listing down. And sometimes it's not even bad actors, it's just ignorance, right? Somebody that wants to resell your product, uploads or says information that is wrong, that will impact you immediately. So best tip ever to prevent that and make your listings like defensible or, or create a wall around them, optimize for it. Meaning input information in every single field that is possible to, to input information. To this point, I think it's just relevant. For example, this is coffee, right? But I'm, I have here the CPSI uh, warning. This is not relevant at all for my product. So what I I'll put here is just not applicable, right? But the fact that I have information in that field will prevent or will prevent to be to that field being open to other people to input information. Uh, yeah. so we've got a couple of comments coming in. Um, by the way, Hura says the fix to the date format we use is in Excel formatting the column to year, month, day. Hopefully that helps. Um, so us Americans, we do it backwards than everybody else in the world. Um, and so sometimes the date time formats get crossed in the data template upload. So that's a great tip. Thank you for that, Hura. Appreciate that. Um, let's see, says Amazon has mapped our SKU to an unknown ASIN and is not linking back to the original ASIN. So uh, have you tried deleting the SKU and re-uploading? Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what would you suggest they do, Vanessa? Um, a mapping situation is something that obviously the super easy and um, kind of do-it-yourself process is just deleting it and trying to upload it again. But if that's not working, you need to understand why it's mapping it to the wrong ASIN. And that could be, it could be potentially of having an issue with the UPC. So if that UPC was claimed by somebody else, and especially if this is a new issue, if this happened in the past, I said two, two or, or one month, if that, that's new, Somebody could have claimed the UPC that you were using before for a different ASIN, leaving the listing that you have to be created by a new ASIN. And I saw that a lot. There was a, a day, I don't know, I think it was two weeks ago, where I seen so many ASINs or so many UPCs getting mapped to the wrong ASIN. It's because something was happening in the back end that they were trying to map GS1 UPCs, creating a mess. It was a mess. We couldn't fix it through a flat file. So, yeah, you can try it, like do it yourself. It doesn't cost you anything. Just delete it and upload it again to see if that works. But it's very likely that you need to open a case for it. And one thing about cases is that once you understand the issue, you will be able to communicate the, the problem or, or the solution in a right way. This is a mapping issue. So, so you will open the ticket or the email or call or whatever. And you're going to say like, hey, I have an, a mapping issue with this SKU. And hopefully you are using the original SKU, by the way. 
with this queue and that was for this icing seen before but now we have a new one therefore we lost all the things blah, blah, blah. we need to do a remapping of that skew when you communicate that or when you communicate the problem that way they will be able to understand the issue and kind of referring to their internal SOPs to fix that. Different, it, it will be very different results or it will take a long time for you if you just say like, hey, uh, my SKU now has a different AC. Like, that's not helpful at all. You're not being efficient. So you need to try to deconstruct the issue enough for them to, for, for you to tell them like, hey, this is this we think is the main issue. We need to do a remapping and communicate that properly. It wasn't we, we weren't able to fix that through a flat file. So open, opening a case is the way to go in this in this matter. Um, by the way, somebody asked earlier that was Jeff, uh, how to best let me pull up the question here. What tools do you recommend to upload image URLs so they end up in Amazon required JPEG? So this is an answer to your question, Jeff. Uh, you can use tools like Imgur, I-M-G-U-R, to load it. And you just go to imgur.com slash upload, and then you can get them to convert the image. So we have a guide on this. I posted this in the chat there for you, Jeff. Um, so feel free to check that out. And basically, uh, you can right click an image from any source, download it, upload it. Uh, and then sometimes you can file tickets if you're not getting your image to reflect. Uh, another thing you could do is you can you can download that category listings report and then simply have the URLs uh, available in the image files there as well. And then just do a re upload. And sometimes that will con convert them. But I generally don't recommend PNGs. They have the most problems. So check out that guide over at my Amazon guys website. Jeff, that might help you out. Uh, yeah. Let's look at the next question. Uh, Janessa says, that's a great idea. I actually don't know which comment she's re referencing, but Vanessa, you've had quite a few great ideas today, so there's quite a few of them to pick. Um, what are some of the problems or cases that are solved only with a flat file method, Vanessa? Oh, great question. Um, only about a flat file. Well, uh, the one thing that I love about flat files, especially like the category listing report, is that, or or any category specific flat file, once you upload it, and if you have any errors in the in the information that you input or in the way you input the information, the, the flat file will tell you once you download the processing fit report, right? When you download the report with the errors, there is a section there, like a tab, in the template that will say like you have error one two three and you need to change this or that or you need to do this and that once you have those type of errors that is completely solvable through a flat file okay so you can do it the i will say that the things that are not able like a, a flat file is not able to fix is when you have contribution problems when you are trying to change a title and that title is not being changed through a flat file. Like flat files are the most powerful way to make changes in the catalog. But if that's not working, you probably have a, a contribution error. So everything else that is outside of contribution errors or things like that are completely solvable through a flat file. So if you want to change images, it is very possible that you will be, if you don't have any other issues going on, it is very possible that you're going to upload it or change it in the flat file and that will work, right? So they're an amazing tool, but sometimes uh, sellers try to use it for very complex contribution problems, and that's not the way. And the other thing that I'll say is that this is just, we're just talking now, or, or the example that I show you is a category listing report where the information of your listing is right all the attributes all the keywords or the or the you know specs and stuff like that but there is one that is also for for troubleshooting and problem solving which is the inventory loader file and in with the inventory loader file you can delete information to then fix it to then upload it again and that's probably our number one way to go each time we're seeing a problem it's like hey let's try it with the inventory loader file we normally when once we when we're trying to see if this work we don't wait 24 hours 
we we just wait way less just to see if it refreshes like well enough i i agree with you steve steven like the fact that we need to delete for 24 hours is a mess like it's terrible you're losing cells but that's sometimes way better than spending two weeks of trying to solve the issue with seller support and you know back and forward all your time invested and also the impact that that has to yourself like having the wrong image for example or to your account so it's a trade-off it's like what do i prefer having the listing down for 24 hours and you know it you know the loss of revenue there or wasting a bunch of time energy and yeah potentially money that you're losing two weeks trying to solve this through a case so I will normally say that a, a, the 24 hour option is better, especially because if if that works, you don't need to you know, waste time with anybody at seller support. And that's just a better mental health <laughs> option. It can be. All right. Yarrow says how to update the field, which is locked, like minimum age recommended. Uh, good question. So there are two types of fields. The open fields that are completely open to whatever you want to put there. So let's say keywords. The, the keywords field is open. You can input uh, letters, numbers, whatever it is. And there are other ones that are drop down menu only. And they are called closed fields. The only options that you have to input that the information there are the, is the drop down menu that Amazon gives you. So for in minimal age recommended, I believe that they have a drop down menu there. It'll be like it's just it's just gonna be numbers, right? Uh, you cannot input anything else outside of that. And I've seen in many cases, I've seen that you download a flat file uh, or a category listing report, and you don't get the drop down menus. So if you want to get the drop down menus, make sure that you are unprotecting your sheet. And that's something, let me, let me share my screen to, sh to yep, tell you how you do it. In the K in this case, um, do you okay. ever, do you ever switch the template over to like the category, um, like the non category specific templates or like, yes. a, like a home level, for example? Yes, um, I do that when, so if an account has multiple categories, multiple product lines, and we want to do optimization in, in one specific, I prefer to use a category specific template than the category listing report, just because having multiple categories will make my file very heavy. And you know it's it's a it's very hard to work on a file that is so heavy, especially when you need to discriminate the the attributes that are relevant or not for that category. So yeah, I do that. Um, in review here, and well, I don't I don't have it here. This is just the this is just an example, like a template example. This is not the category listing report. It's just a dummy one that I use for presentations. But um, for the question, this section that you see here, so you click review and you click protect sheet. Probably once you, once you download a, a file from Amazon, this will set unprotect sheet. You need to click that so you are able to input information the best way and you yeah. will see the drop down menu. So you will click That's here. a really important hack that Vanessa just gave guys unprotecting the sheets to make sure you can upload everything and get all the data loaded. Highly recommend that. That's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is that you will see at the bottom of your, of your sheet, you will see different tabs like value values, data definition, template, instruction, images, examples, and so on. If you have a field that is a drop down menu, and you're not seeing the the options, you could go to a uh, valid value step in the valid value step and find the attribute and see what are the valid values. And that tab will tell you which ones are are the valid values. So you can you know type that. If you type something that is wrong and you upload that file, it will come back with an error saying like this is an invalid value. You need to change it. So Car yeah. Carl says you can also create uploadable image URLs using a special hack in Google Photos. 
Um, so yep, Carl, we've done that before too. I like the imager one, um, makes it a little bit more public URL, a little easier. Uh, Irhan says Amazon created our ASINs in 2013. That's a long time ago. You're a pro long time OG Amazon seller. I cannot add GS1 UPC codes to the ASIN. How can I add the UPC? So I have a lot of things I could talk about this, but I'm going to do my best to just let you run the show on this one because I want to see if I learned something from Vanessa today on UPC changes. What should Erhan do? Okay, so we recently find that if you will ask me this question like a month ago, I'll say impossible. Like, you know, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. But because we are problem solvers and because a lot of sellers are in the same situation, we need to find a way around. So there is a process actually on, on with seller support that will make or they have the ability to update UPCs. The thing that you need for that is the GS1 certificate that matches the same company name with under the under which the account is registered so if I, my, if my company name for the account is one two three make sure that you buy the gs1 upc codes with the same company and potentially well hopefully that same company is the owner of your trademark as well because you're gonna need to um send proof of affiliation so when you have that you have the proof of affiliation meaning that the brand is the owner of those UPCs, but sometimes, you know, your brand name is not necessarily your company name. That's why they need a proof of affiliation. Then you're going to need the, the UPC certificate that you the, of the new ones and the list of all the ones that you want to change, okay? So you're going to open the case, and the only way to change it is through a case. You're going to open the case, and you're going to request for the process of GS1 UPC update. You're gonna say like, "Hey guys, this is our these are our listings. This is our new GS1 UPCs. We did not have that because we created the list in 2013, and that's when this policy was not in place. So you're technically good in that sense of they cannot blame you for doing that because that was almost well, 10 no years ago, right? They'll yank the listing though, whenever they feel what? like. <laughs> what? Well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even if, even if you're compliant or were compliant, Amazon doesn't care. They'll just yank it. But keep going. So so you open the case and you tell them you send that all that information and make sure to send it in the first contact because they will if you don't send enough information or you don't send those three, they will come back to you and reply. We need more information. And you, that's just not efficient. Um, so you're asked for that process. GS1 UPC update. OK, and they will go through the thing and that's probably will require require an escalation to a captive team, but they are able to change it. We have we have been successful doing it. It takes a while. It's not a it's not an easy answer that you're going to get like in less than, I don't know, 24 hours. It's not. Oh, yeah, we already changed it. Or I don't know if they've been they ha they have becoming better but in our experience. Not really. So it takes about like five to seven days for them to migrate everything. And at the end, the answer there will be, they, so what they will do is to clean the fields and input the new ones. So what you're going to do in your end, at the end, when they say like, we already upload the new UPCs, is that you're going to upload a flat file with the new UPCs. And that will, so with the new UPCs and the SKU that you had, and that will match it to the new AC. So it is, it is tedious. It takes time and a lot of patience going back and forth because it is not a process that all um, seller support associates know about. Okay. So you need to be persistent. It is possible. We have done it. We have been successful. It's just in its, in its time. So I have a lot of videos on UPC changes and a lot of opinions, but for the sake of time, go find them on the channel. Um, Erhan says, I contacted brand support. They said you have to create a new ASIN. If I create a new ASIN, what should I do? All ASINs have decent reviews. Just do an ASIN merger, Erhan. We found that to be very effective. Donovan said, I uploaded my original flat file listing with no image links. 
Amazon assigned a main image to my product that isn't my product. Amazon isn't letting me change my main image. What should I do? My first question for Donovan would be, are the UPCs previously loaded to Amazon by somebody else? Because I'm pretty confident, this is speculation, but I'm pretty confident GS1 was hacked by the Chinese and all the UPCs got ported to somewhere else. Uh, and you may want to validate whether that data was preloaded. Uh, but Vanessa, what should Donovan do to start trying to troubleshoot this? Yeah, that's uh, one of the first points that we were talking about. So first of all, try to see if upload the file with the image and instead of an async to the UPC, as you mentioned, that's the first thing that I'll do. The second one is if, so they say that the main image is in the product. That's the thing. So troubleshooting and, and watching for other contributions in other marketplaces. So if you have your account and by default that's open in Mexico and Canada, go to, to Mexico and Canada, even when you're not selling there, even when you're not selling there and probably you don't have the listing, even listed in the catalog there. Try to list that there and see what's the image that's coming uh, from that and upload the image that you want. So align all the marketplaces that you're open, uh, align all the images, right? Once you have that, and if that's not reflecting in the front end of amazon.com, you need to open the case. And as we mentioned before, the best way and the best argument for them to change the image, especially the main image, is that you send them the manufacturer website, like your Shopify or your D2C, whatever website that you're using for your brand, send it send it with the link of the product and make sure that the main image that you want to input on Amazon is the one that you're pushing through a flat farm. That is the, the best hack because they don't have an argument against you saying like, oh no, we're not going to change it. It's because you are, you are sending the right information, like the official information from the manufacturer website. So a bunch of things, a bunch of steps, this could be solved by a, by a flat file if you do the UPC and if you do it in other marketplaces as well. And if that doesn't work at all, then go through the case and send the proof that the image that you want to upload, it's aligned with the manufacturer website. Hassan asks, how to know which SKU for multi-SKU ASIN has con contribution rights? Um, so I don't know if they're asking uh, if there's multiple SKUs on their own account and which one's yeah. got contribution. I, Vanessa, didn't you answer this and said the original SKU? Yeah, the original SKU is the one that holds all the contributions. But but that's uh, something that could come with malpractice, Stephen. Uh, let's say that I created three SKUs, right? So in my original SKU, I have the titles and the bullet points. But then in the second SKU, I put the A plus content and the, and the description. And in the third SKU, I'm putting keywords. So if you have all the different or all those attributes spread across SKUs, you're going to have problems once you try to change the information. So always refer to the original SKU. And if you say like, oh my God, I deleted the original SKU, I don't have it anymore, try to find it. So if you have an old file that was in the past or an old um, report from an order or a sell or a shipment, that you say like, oh, I created my SKU in 2017, but I don't have the SKU anymore. Refer to any report that will give you the SKU and make sure to release the original SKU. Once you do that, start making changes there and not in the new ones. Super, super relevant. And it's one of Agreed. the biggest ways to change information that people don't understand. Like, it's just not, that's not a public like information in the catalog. Uh, Lung says, why do my listings change to FBM after I update my FBA listing? This is a great question. I wish I knew the answer, but I don't. Do you? Uh, why do my listing change to so, FBM? So, yeah, sometimes it just flips over. Even and, and let's assume that they did nothing wrong. Let's assume they were perfect. Okay, They didn't mm -hmm. accidentally leave the uh, Amazon underscore NA blank or anything like that. I've seen this myself. Sometimes Amazon just flips the listing. Have you have you ever seen this, Vanessa? Yes. Yes, that it goes. So the way to solve it, well, I don't know. If if you're doing everything right and if you're not leaving anything blank for the FBA information, I will say like, well, that's Amazon. that's Amazon. But assuming that you don't know, right? The ways the things that you need to watch for, and let me show you here in the screen. 
Yeah, show show them the uh, Amazon fulfilled by column. Yeah. So it is like a bl light blue section, almost at the end. No, this is not like blue here. Okay, so you have this part. This is the most important column. Fulfillment so, center ID, Amazon yes. underscore NA. If blank yes. and you do an update, it'll convert it back to FBM. Correct, correct. On yeah. um, also, if you don't, imagine that you just have that one, but you don't input the information in the compliance section, which is the next one, kind of purple, brown, I don't know. Uh, this section uh, is the product of battery or utilized batteries. If you don't have information here, you won't have the hazmat information for FBA. Therefore, your async could be changed to FBM because you don't have that information. So make sure to input here, let's say no, and then valid is included, you always say no, and the other columns that are relevant for hazmat and will switch your async back to FBM if you don't do it, is the compliance, this, this one. Uh, applicable dangerous goods regulation. So you actually have five different columns. So number one, two, three, four, and five. These ones, you need to have the information of dangerous goods. If it's not applicable, you will put not applicable in all, um, or if there is any other uh, type of thing or your product has any kind of regulation, you're gonna input the appropriate regulation. But if you don't have this, the battery information and the fulfillment center ID in the file, it's super like, that's that's how it's gonna be. Like they're gonna change it to FBM because you are not compliant to be FBA. So then you're gonna have stranded inventory and you're gonna click change to FBA and you're gonna answer those questions and that's the way to solve it. But if you wanna prevent that in the future, just make sure those three areas are covered. We're joined today by Vanessa Hung, who is a catalog flat file and troubleshooting expert. We've got a few more questions in queue here today. Erhan clarifies their earlier note about UPCs from 2013. Uh, no initiated UPCs for those ASINs. Also, um, they have GS, GS, GTIN exemption, so they don't have UPCs at all. So it, one of the questions I haven't answered myself is whether the exemption will still work post GS1 requirements. As far as I know, I would assume it does. Vanessa, yeah. have you seen the exemption still work? Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay. I haven't seen Yank exemption, like GS1 exemption. I haven't either. Yeah. Um, but, but Erhan, if you are trying to load UPCs for those ASINs at this stage, make sure you buy them from GS1, have your GS1 certificate, load that to the account before you start loading them, get them to approve and accept the GS1 cert that typically takes about 48 hours. Following that, I would download your CLR report, which we posted a link earlier today on how to download that and then simply fill them in and load them. Uh, if you don't have UPCs, those fields will often show ASIN instead of the UPC. Simply change those two columns, the UPC field, as well as the GTIN field from ASIN over to UPC. But you know, you know one thing uh, is that if, I don't know if they are trying to solve an issue or they're trying to prevent an issue. And I, I will say that, especially for the GS1 UPCs, prevention is not happening at all so imagine that this seller is a very you know good seller and is trying to prevent any issues and they're doing that due, due diligence to get to not get restricted in the future there is not a path unless your ASIN is down there is not a path to change the UPC unless your ASIN is triggered by not having the proper UPCs so it and it is so unfortunate that Amazon is this way but they don't have many SOPs and practices to be proactively changing information or, you know, looking for stuff. Same thing they did with the insurance, like in a year ago or so. It's like you couldn't you couldn't send the insurance information. You just were waiting every single day that they shut you down or they send you an email of like, give us the information. There is no proactive way. So left handed Amazon does not know what the right handed Amazon is doing. I don't even yeah, like the, like the left team, that's the compliance team. They're like, everybody must have GS1 certificates. Yeah. And then on the right hand, seller support, you cannot change UPC codes. Yeah. And they're like fighting each other. And then this has like been the case for two years on Amazon. And then all of a sudden the compliance team's like, 
your listing gets a yank and your listing gets a yank like it's Oprah Winfrey going to town here. So, yeah, it's a lot of challenges with UPCs and, and catalog issues. Yeah, 100 percent. It's terrible. The prevention part is just so unfortunate. Uh, Z says, hey, I wanted to ask my inventory is in transit. What is the best time for creating a PPC plan? Should I wait till my inventory goes or should I create now? Easy answer on this one, Z, 100% of the time, make it now, especially because there's a field, and this is a template field that Vanessa can tell you how to disable, to make it so that your product goes live before the inventory checks in. And what happens is, is your prime is like two-week shipment. And so you spend a bunch of PPC, you waste it, you start your honeymoon period early. I don't recommend going live until you have two-day prime. So, Vanessa, do you know which field I'm talking about on how yes. to disable? And what's what's that field called? I forget. Yeah, uh, me too. I, I'm looking for it. Uh, launch date? Launch date. Launch date, yes. Launch date. Well, so well, let me, well there's, well, a couple, yeah, there's a couple of things you could do. There's three fields you can set to make it so your item doesn't go live. But in addition to that, um, and that's the safest way to do it, and I highly recommend that. So, so Vanessa is going to show us launch date. There's, yeah, right there. So put that in the future and then build your PPC. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a new uh, new feature where if you don't have this stuff filled in, Amazon will start turning your inventory live before it even arrives at Amazon. So just be careful. You're not wasting your honeymoon period, not wasting your PPC uh, before that goes live. Freddie says you have to have activated the global listing. That'll probably pertain to something we talked about earlier 10 or so minutes ago. Uh, yeah. Why you reject internship applications within four to five minutes? So, <laughs> Abdul, we have 20,000 people every year that apply to my Amazon guy. We have streamlined a bunch of triggers based on parts of the process. So we auto reject people very quickly uh, if we know they're, they're not possessing a very specific thing that we're looking for. That's just the only way to do it at scale. So, Abdul, we apologize. Probably not going to be a good fit for you. But this is why we launched Mag School to give back to the Amazon community, to people in Pakistan, Philippines, all over the world. Take those courses, get certified. It will help you get uh, employment somewhere else. And then second, we made SolarCentralJobs.com to help you get in touch with other employers. Santa says, great session. Thank you very much. Lung says, thanks so much. Love you guys. Appreciate that, Lung. Very nice endorsement. Uh, Janessa wants to know more about Vanessa here. So Vanessa, where can people follow you? Perfect. So um, one of my favorite social media channels right now is LinkedIn. And you also are very, very active on LinkedIn. So on LinkedIn Probably, is yeah. Vanessa Hung. That's the best one. I love it. It's super easy because you can put a lot of information and people really pay attention. So um, best way to contact me there, DM me or follow the content, a bunch of management information. Also, I have an Instagram account. It, it's at it's Vanessa Hong. And that is just cool information. Normally, I'm, I'm trying to get better at making reels and making, you know, good videos for that channel because that's what uh, Instagram prioritizes. But also we have a bunch of processes. So carousels with information of uh, SOPs and stuff like that. And if you want to send me an email, it's Vanessa at onlinesellersolutions.com. Uh, that's also a website, Online Seller Solutions. That's the name of the, the agency. And yeah, those are the channels where you can contact me. Also, Facebook. You can also send me a French friend request on Facebook. It's Vanessa Hong. And Vanessa's at a lot of the events from time to time. And so if you're in the States and come to one of the big events, you'll probably find Vanessa there. Hura says, that was very insightful. Thank you, Stephen and Vanessa. Uh, a random Facebook user asks, why in 2022 is the ACOS going very high? Uh, my, my short answer on that is because it's easier to put money into PPC than do the hard work, like fixing your template and uploading template files. And that's why people would rather throw money at the problem than to do some of the dirty, unfavorable, unflattering template work. It's like micros, dirty jobs going on over here. Um, Erhan says, because we want to use manufactured barcodes when sending shipments to FBA, not FN SKU, because it requires extra prepping work, we don't want any, an exemption. We have a vendor account too. So Erhan oh. definitely definitely would recommend getting your, your GS1 certificate loaded, as well as the UPCs assigned to each ASIN. It's going to be a lot of work. 11 out of 10 is what I would rate this problem. Yep. Um, very difficult. So. Especially if the ACs were created in vendor. That would be 
Yeah. So then, vendor makes it even harder uh, to get mm-hmm. this shit. Yeah. You're going to be filing a lot of tickets there. No doubt about it. Um, all right. So we're going a little bit over time today. So Vanessa, we talked today about template uploads and flat files and a lot of troubleshooting. Let's end with this. Give us your best 30 second Amazon hack. What's something somebody should do today to improve their sales? I'm going to reuse the hack of Prosper, like uh, because I believe people still are unaware of it. You're right. It's, it's making or, first of all, fixing the listing in Spanish, making sure the Spanish translation of <laughs> your ASIN or your listing in Amazon.com is good. So if you guys don't know what that is, it's basically this thing. Super easy, and I hope this is still my 30 seconds, Steve. So here, when you toggle down the flag and you click Spanish, then you will start you will start seeing. Oh, the so, information here, the listing in Spanish. So best trick is make sure that your listing has a proper Spanish translation. And if Most it doesn't times, yeah, I'll go what should with I do? That. Yeah, uh, most times uh, in the Spanish translation, the listings. So this is a perfect example. You see here, these guys have only four bullet points in Spanish. But if I go to this listing in English, Maso menos. Yeah, Muy this poquito. probably has more. <laughs> My three oh, years no, of no. high school no, Spanish come in handy. Yeah, so. Sometimes you feel you, you miss information like bullet points, description, the title is terrible. So make sure to do that. And one of the things that I learned, Steve, at Accelerate, that's the event that Amazon made at their headquarters. Well, not the headquarters, but in Seattle with all the Amazon reps and all stuff. They told me, and they, this is like official information. There are 38 million of people that are using their whole experience, the website and the app, mo- the mobile app in Spanish. Before, so before, when I came across to this uh, content, I went to the stocks and said like, okay, there are 70 million of Hispanic consumers in the US, right? And going but, up by like a million per month with immigration. Yes, yes. so that, that that's the fastest growing demographic in the US. So, so, but, but we didn't know, like, how many of those are Prime members? How many of those use really Amazon in Spanish? Well, I know the answer now is 38 million. Like 38 I, million I, potential customers, and they want to see things in Spanish. So you guys got to start paying attention to it. Um, yeah. A couple of years ago, I won a big fight in the Amazon community proving A-plus content indexes. What I kept trying to tell everybody to prove it was put Spanish in the alt text of your photos. At least one photo, it will index in under 48 hours. Pretty much guarantee it. Getting a lot of love and feedback from today's session. Isis says, love this session. Carl giving us three fire flames up. Wow. Thank you very much. You guys want to help us out with the session today? You're watching this, the replay. Hit that like button and throw down a comment. I bet you Vanessa might even come back and answer some questions in the comments on the replay. Yeah, so definitely sure. do that. Uh, Janessa says, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Vanessa. Enjoyed the discussion today. Um, we did have a couple of uh, wholesale questions. I'll answer real briefly, and then we're going to wrap. Please share FBA wholesale buy box win trick. Make sure you answer your customer questions and have FBA on the listings. Don't drop ship. Your model is dying. Allie says, how can we avoid IP complaints? Any solutions against uh, except scan unlimited? Um, Allie, your, pr- your, your drop ship model is dying. It is not going to last for more than another year or two before everybody gets banned. So just be prepared to launch private label. Um, drop shipping is one of the most prolific business models right now over in Pakistan, which is why the U.S. members shouldn't even attempt it because they're going to get beat by the Pakistanis who have way more eagerness and hunger to win. But but drop shipping in, in general, Amazon is hostile to your model. That is our show today. Uh, feel free to click that rewind button, a bunch of template file hacks and whatnot. And Vanessa, if somebody wants to find more template file learnings, where should they go? Oh, perfect. So if you go to my LinkedIn or my Inst- uh, yeah, Instagram bio, I have a link there. And it's a link tree of 
all the presentations and webinars like this that I have had like throughout the year and years creating content. So you will find a masterclass on flat files, a masterclass on how to create that uh, there. So where's the link tree so I can post this in the comments for everybody? How do I find it? I'm on LinkedIn um, right now. Let me know. Go to, can you go to Instagram? All right. Let's Google you going to Vanessa Hong Instagram. Is that you? No. No. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to don't click a random just, Vanessa Hong. Just, just click right. Instagram. Well, I'll, I'll send the link. Just to make sure I don't randomly click on some porn on Instagram. Go ahead and send a comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard that you have a bad experience with that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we had a bad experience a couple weeks ago. All right. So, thank yeah. you, Vanessa, for coming on. Appreciate it. She's going to add her link tree in a comment live on this video. So, come back and add that in if you want to find more of her stuff. Uh, and that is the My Amazon Guy podcast. We'll be back uh, in two days with Jason with Ask Me Any Amazon Question at noon Eastern Standard Time. Thanks for coming on, Vanessa. Thank you.